Muy buenos días a todos los ministros y colaboradores. Good morning to all the ministers and collaborators gathered there in Palmira Valle, Colombia, and all those who have come from different cities and departments, and also our brother Reverend Mario Villegas there, the Reverend Ivan Sarmiento, the Reverend Fernando Cubillos, who have this meeting of ministers there today, Monday, August 8 of this year, 2022. And also in all the places where they will be gathered, either today or these next days. May God bless you greatly. And may these small portions that I will be sharing with you be of a great blessing. And so we can continue maturing our faith. As he wrote there in a writing in the book of quotations, which I will read it to you later on, and to continue with this time of preparation for our transformation. Yesterday we were looking at several writings and several portions which we have been told that in this time each one will recognize and will know in which place, in which group he or she belongs to, either the wise virgins, the sleeping virgins or unbelievers. In other words, that teaching will be opened, which will contain or contain the fruits of each virgin, the foolish virgin, the wise virgins, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins and the unbelievers. That teaching will be given which will be shown there by their fruits to which group each individual belongs to. A chosen of God, a wise virgin, will always be believing the word. In her there is no unbelief. In her there is faith, which day by day is growing until she obtains that perfect faith for her transformation and for the rapture. The foolish virgin or sleeping virgin, as our brother William calls them, or full virgin, is a person like Thomas. They have to see to believe. And surely, in every place, both that individual who knows that he acted in that way and still thinks, until I see, I don't believe, And also when one sees from afar that this person acts like that, automatically, look how simple it is, automatically one already identifies him. It is not that one is going to cast him aside, but rather help him as much as possible because he or she must prepare themselves to give up their life in the Great Tribulation unless they have already crossed the line and their name is blotted out, which we do not desire that to happen in those people whom many of them may have had fellowship with us. They have worked in many areas with us and that then, at the end of the way, their name is erased or blotted out. That is something very but very sad. It is as he said once in the message. The new temple, he spoke it and in others he has spoken it. I'm going to read you this part here where he speaks of that because a chosen of God doesn't want a foolish virgin or full virgin 
or naive virgin to have their names erased from the book of life. He says, We thank God that he has been working in our hearts so that it is not in an intellectual way that we were making things right, but it is truly repentant from the heart. If you do not do it in that way, even if you say all the things, you haven't done anything either because you are not repentant and forgiveness is received by those who repent and turn away from sin. So I love you wholeheartedly with divine love and even though you have acted the way you have acted, I still love you. I will continue with you until everything is right before God, until God gives us the blessing he has promised to give us. It will be as in the days of Moses that Moses went on even though his people were a rebellious people. They tried to stone him for about 10 or 12 times, but he still loved them. Even though there were false anointed ones among them, Moses continued forward. He loved even the false anointed ones. And if it is not God who says to him, turn away, turn away from them. Moses did not turn away because he loved them. When one can feel love, divine love, even for the false anointed ones, that indicates that God has to do something and that if God is not the one who works, then nothing will be done. We also know that Jesus loved Judas dearly and the hard thing has always been for a man of God to love a false anointed one, to love a Korah, a Judas, a Cain, a son of the devil. The hard thing is to love them. Not because you don't want to love them, but because you don't want all those judgments to come to those people. Because you love them, and you don't want them to cross the line. You know that at some point, they will cross it. Remember, that in a place Brother Branham speaks that the ministry that Judah had passed on to Paul. Something like that. I mean, we have to search well to be clear about it. But, I mean, if you look, notice that the great ministry that he had and the name was written in the book of life. You fight so that they do not cross it, and they fight to cross it, and they rise up against you, and then at the end, they realize the evil they did, and then you can no longer help them. And that is like when one tries to speak and say things to help them and many times or on some occasions as it happened in that case to brother William there that we were reading yesterday because he put his hand in for a brother that situation happened to him there and he almost lost his arm I remember that occasion They were telling, he told or he talked with Julio, with my dad, with Humberto. And I was a little boy. And I remember that that was very hard and difficult for Brother William on that occasion. When he tried to put his hand in for a person. And it is better to leave that alone because in that way we wouldn't be getting into something that God is allowing that is something that God is imparting on those people 
that we do not know at that moment if it is blessing or a judgment. And if one puts his hand in when God has already dictated a judgment, one can also get his own, his own little piece. In other words, if the brethren, if the people, both the wise, the wise virgins as the foolish virgins, we're not going to talk about the unbelievers because they no longer have a chance, as we may say. There is no way for them to be erased or removed from there because they have never been written. But the foolish, mainly, if they knew how delicate this part of going against the divine program is, and if they knew that, this would cost them their eternal life to continue living, existing eternally, they would think twice to go against the divine program. What is at stake for that group of the foolish virgins is eternal life. In other words, after he passed through this planet Earth and knew the divine program, knew everything like Thomas, he knew everything. He was in all the activities of Jesus. It wasn't enough to see him, to work with him, to eat with him and to be with him. That didn't help him at all because at the end, if he did not see, he did not believe. And he is considered there, it says there, as a foolish In other words, we cannot lean back and say, no, I'm with him, I'll walk with him. He was my friend. He was there with me. Don't lean on that. Because if you act or have acted in the same way that Thomas acted or Judas acted or Dathan, Korah, Abiram or Cain acted, then your name can be erased or blotted out. It is a very but very delicate time. These are just a few seconds of time that we are here on this planet Earth compared with an entire eternity. And if one could do something, one would do it so that his name would not be erased. One, by knowing the whole divine program and seeing how advanced everything is and even seeing people still going on and on and on and on. And one says, truly, how is it that a person fights to go to the great tribulation? And one is left saying, but it is not possible. How is it that he goes on? And even those people who also applaud all that, because people believe that by hiding behind the telephone, behind the computer, and doing things, they believe that, that, that they are hidden, so God doesn't see it, or the brethren doesn't see it. See, all of this is also helpful for each one to see in which position, in which group each individual is. We don't have to be asking or anything, but with the performances, we can see to which group each person belongs to. Some don't say nothing and only send those symbols of applauses and things, and others with a little thumbs up and everything. Already all those people, it is as if they were putting all of that and making it public. They are all people of that same line. They are foolish. See? They go on identifying themselves because they are people who attack the divine program and they attack everything God is doing because since it is not done according to the way they want it to be done, then they start to fight. And that is how it's got to be. We cannot prevent that. 
right now. So it's after this audio, maybe a lot of people will start to speak against it because it has to be like that. They are people already ordained for that. This is why I was telling you this day, don't try to make them believe because already if they don't believe, they don't believe. And what we're trying to do is for them not to be erased or blotted out. In other words, all those people who support that kind of movement, that kind of action, they automatically belong to the foolish. They are foolish virgins. This hasn't been spoken clearly before because before the time had not come to do it. But this is the time. Now is the time to know to which group you belong to. If you are of the wise virgins, if you are of the foolish virgins, and if you are of the unbelievers, you already know that you are an unbeliever. But mainly now, everything is being focused to those two groups. We don't include the 144,000 because God already knows who they are. But within the group, as he says yesterday in a part of the excerpt, they are sitting there in the same bench with you. And what we have to do, as he says, the recommendation is to work in harmony, both with one another. And he who knows he's a foolish by the things he has done or she has done and let him ask God that his name be not erased if he hasn't already crossed the line. So he must prepare himself more to give up his life in the Great Tribulation. And then after the millennium, they will be resurrected. And we will see how they come out of the judgment. Because if before the word they have taken an attitude that wasn't correct, God will already know there. If they come out well, they will enter into eternity. If not, they will be cast into the lake of fire to disappear eternally. In other words, it is so, so delicate. That one who is written in the book of life because he or she is, let us say, in the thin line. Everything depends on the attitude they have had before the word. And in this time, it is so and so delicate as far as how God is fulfilling everything that it is so simple that that same simplicity makes the human being as he tends to reason and tends to have that inclination to try to nitpick and notice no that can't be so and there is where disbelief comes in the same thing I repeat again as happened to Thomas a person who was all the time with Jesus and then at the end he had to see in order to believe he had to put his finger in order to believe in Jesus side there and as our brother William continues to say here then they realize that you loved them so dearly that you were trying to deliver them from hell and the lake of fire but when it is too late you can't do nothing but one still loving them and that is a good sign that is a sign of the age of the cornerstone because that is the product of that age that is produced by the message pertaining for that time it makes that divine love come out from within and if something could be done for a person so that he or she doesn't be lost it would be done but sometimes they don't allow themselves to be helped and since each person has free will by the free will each person will be judged therefore we know in this hour that many things have happened in the spiritual realm many things have happened I have seen them through the word through what God has shown me and I have even seen and known things that sometimes one would never want to know.
Brother Branham says, you say you wish you had a ministry of this kind, Brother Branham's kind, a ministry of a prophet, a greater prophet, he said, you don't know the responsibility that goes with a ministry of this kind, and that you will have to give an account for every word that is spoken, and no one through that ministry and that gift that is in the person one sees and knows things that one would never wish to have known but one knows them and there is nothing one can do about it and he keeps talking in this whole message about all of that let's read a little bit more You know that Brother Branham in his time of ministry, he knew many false prophets. He knew many false anointed ones, even from the message. That is many preachers, and he also refers to many people that also thought, let's say, that they were right, that they were anointed by God. He says, and even from the message. And he had to keep those things in his heart and suffer them in his heart because he loved those people by knowing what was in store for those people and even knowing of some who had already crossed the line and had no place to turn back. So it is these days. They are things that one knows that one wouldn't like to know them because by knowing them brings so much suffering to one that one cries, suffers, pray to God, and there is no remedy. Do you want a case? Samuel wept and cried before God for soul. And do you know what God said to him? Weep no more for him. I have rejected him. Do you see? It was too late for soul. Therefore, God called it his prophet. And with all of that, the prophet still loved soul. Do you see? The hard thing is for the divine love to be manifested itself in each one of us. And then you meet people, enemies, and all kinds of people who have no hope anymore. And you love them and want to do something for them. And you can't do anything. That is the hard thing. Because it gives you suffering so you can see that the group of this time is going to know many things that are going to cause much suffering because of the divine love that there is in our hearts and we will not be able to do anything it is likely that we may meet so many false anointed ones at this time and know that they have already crossed the line but that we love them so much that just knowing that they have already crossed the line give us such a strong pain in our heart that we wish we have never met those people. I have quoted this. It was in this message. I quoted it from uh, on my mind. I read this uh, some time ago that one loves so much those people because you have even worked with them and struggled with them in many things in past times. And he goes on saying, we would like rather that we had never known those people existed because by knowing them, we love them so much from the heart inside that we would not like it to be that way for them. But we can't do anything and we have to resign ourselves to the reality. So we have to be realistic. Even if we tear ourselves up inside with love, we have to be realistic. Even if our heart bleeds with love for them, we can't stop loving them. But we have to be realistic and know that their reality is that one. And this is a time in which all those things will be known, which each group will be identifying itself to the place. Each individual will be identifying himself to the place where they belong. The elect of God, the wise virgin, they belong to that great theophany 
that came forth from God. We are part of that theophany. And a portion of that theophany has rested in each soul of each elect. Notice what the Reverend William Branham says about that. Look at the picture that he speaks about there. Something so beautiful. He says in the message, Israel in Egypt, it is a volume of several messages. And this is the topic, Israel in Egypt, page 15 of this volume, it says. O Calvary, O Calvary, Jesus bled and died for me. Then he tore the soul of his own son, separated a covenant, separated a covenant, and he throwed the body into the ground. He lay there for three days and nights, it rose up, for it was not possible that my Holy One shall see corruption, neither would I leave his soul in hell. And his soul was his spirit that ascended into hell. And he rose down, God did, and picked up his body and gave him life, and took the body of Jesus and set it at his right hand in glory, and sent back the Holy Ghost as a covenant. And he writes, Holy Spirit, HS, covenant. There you are. Don't fall short of that, brother. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're lost. That's the only. You won't have to worry about getting to heaven. If there is nothing in here supernatural, the doors can't unlock. Notice how tremendous this is. You could walk there and bump your head against it. But if the Spirit of God is in there, the Spirit of God inside will unhinge the doors. Got to have the thing in here to unlock it yonder, see? That's right. So you're already judged just on what you think about Jesus Christ. Now, here he comes, torn, riven, tore to pieces. His soul went to God. God blessed him, and then his soul returned back in the form of the baptism of the Holy Ghost that comes into every believer to sanctify, clean up the mind, clean up the heart, and leave a portion of the Holy Ghost in there. That is to leave a part of him in every soul of every chosen one, here and there. And when the Holy Ghost is given out, that same Holy Spirit that brought the body of Jesus out of the grave will rapture. See? That same Holy Spirit is the one that is going to cry out. The one that is going to look from where it came from, where it existed from, to go back to that place from where it came. He continues to say, and that covenant has to dovetail. Up there we read that he separated. He says, separated a covenant. And he goes on to say, and that covenant had to dovetail. As he tore there and gave the body, went back to God, and the spirit came back to the earth. Then your spirit will have to be the same kind of a spirit, or it'll miss that place going together. See? It has to be that same spirit that he gave when he sent him to earth to every elect of God that received him as their only and sufficient Savior. And now he's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And now he's preparing for his transformation. And that same spirit says that he will rapture him, just as he did with Jesus. If he did that with Jesus, that spirit that was in Jesus, raptured Jesus, well, we already have that certainty that that spirit that rapture Jesus will rapture us. In other words, if you can see there the beautiful thing that God is making known to us there with these words of Brother Branham when he tells us that, if with that spirit that was in Jesus has raptured, raptured him, and he then sent that spirit 
to every child of God, to every chosen of God. And now, at this in time, that he has sent it to every chosen of God when he has received him as our Savior, wash away his sins in the blood of Jesus, has been baptized in water, and has been born again. That same Spirit that is in that wise virgin, in that chosen one, will rapture him, will rapture us. In other words, it will not fail to unite. To unite where? To where he came from from where that spirit that he deposited in each soul of each soul and one came from. It is something beautiful to be able to see all of this. If that same spirit, and I want to repeat it again, because it is something beautiful when you see yourself identified there. And why do we see ourselves identified there? because we have the Spirit that He sent. And if that Spirit, it says, Holy Spirit that brought the body of Jesus out of the grave will rapture, in other words, if He raptured Him, He will rapture each one of us also. He will take us back to our Heavenly Father's house. If it happened With Jesus, it will happen with the chosen ones of the age of the cornerstone. It was in the age of the cornerstone back then that Jesus was raptured and that that spirit, then he sent it. And in the age of the cornerstone here is where that same spirit, God will fulfill the rapture in each one of the chosen ones of God. Amen. Yes, sir. Let me continue reading. Not because you make yourself, but because something, the love of God, has swept into your soul. That store every earthly idol out. There it is. He makes a drawing of the circles, then he puts a small one, a bigger one, and a bigger one. There he doesn't write that he had written in others, but we know that the center is the soul, spirit, and body. And he also writes covenant next to it. And there's something just breathes and call to God. It's your soul in here calling out the Heavenly Father. See? Because it is something that cries out to God. It cries out to our Heavenly Father because from there is that we came from. We belong to that place. He goes on to say, there you are, that gives you a faith and you become the seed of Abraham. You believe God promises like Abraham did. And in the book of quotations, to end this little greeting, which was only a little greeting, On page 167, paragraph 1486, it says, I believe the church is beginning to hear the message and begin to understand. But friend, listen, we've got to lay in the presence of the Son. We've got to be ripened. Our faith isn't ripe. Intellectually, we are hearing the message that God has given us and seeing the signs that He showed us and proving it by the Bible. It's there, but oh, how the church needs to lay in His presence till it tenders up you know, and get sweet in the Spirit so that he can bathe down. Sometimes in speaking the message, there is a part that he speaks about the bride washing her face, something like that. We can later on look it up because I remember when he says wash and there is a part that I think I read that says something about the bride washing her face. Let us, let us go on. Sometimes in speaking the message, you get harsh. Have to break it in like that. Notice that you get harsh. Maybe a lot of things are hard and harsh for speaking them. But notice, he says why. 
have to break it in like, because you've got to clinch a nail to make it hold. And he writes next to it, nail. It is like yesterday's message. I didn't read a part here, which I left it maybe halfway on page 55 of the message, The Coming of the Cornerstone. There is a part that I didn't read, but that speaks about this, where Brother Branham says that sometimes you get harsh. Him talking there about the way he had to be preached or one has to preach. And he goes on to say, where I think I left off here, I have a mark in the book or in the booklet. Possibly I didn't look at it to read it, but let's read it today. It says, in the message the coming of the cornerstone, the majority is not in charge. Mm -hmm. Is the majority of you want me to keep you happy by saying the things I shouldn't say and not saying the things I should say? If you think that way and want me to keep you happy and not tell you the truth, you better leave early before you hear all the things that are yet to be said because you will not resist them. I will be saying whatever I have to say, whatever it takes. And when I say whatever it takes, well, that means even if it costs me my life, as the scripture says. So, it is better to die being faithful to God than not to live being a coward and not saying what needs to be said in the time in which one lives. So, always telling the truth, saying the things that need to be said, will always bring consequences. Notice that John the Baptist, look at Jesus and the apostles, they were all killed. Notice the messengers in the ages, how they were treated. Look at the prophets of the past and look at the scripture, what it says in Revelation 11. That is, all that, when we talk about it, it causes religious zeal, it causes anger, and a lot of things in those other groups that don't belong to the wise ones. Because the wise ones, on the contrary, become more firm, more happy, because they know and are aware of all those things. And that helped them to know how to deal with that kind of situation and to have understanding with all of them. To treat them in a certain way and help them in what can be helped. But those things so hard for some who belong to the group of the foolish, for some, well, they will take it seriously. They will take it seriously and will say, wait, I am going to continue preparing myself because I see that I'm going to the great tribulation. Well, I am going to prepare myself, like the message we were reading yesterday, that if you recognize that you are a foolish, then when you hear all of that, you say, well, I am going to prepare myself more. I am going to feed myself more and prepare myself more so that I will be spiritually strong to give my life in the Great Tribulation. But others, even being of the foolish virgins, hearing those things, they will turn against it more if they were against. Or if not, they will turn against and will then be doing things for which their names are erased or blotted out. There are many people who have even schemed to do things that the only one who did them and originated them was Cain, the first murderer. In other words, they come from that seed. They come with that bad intention already of murderers and all those bad things that are of the kingdom of darkness. That spirit grabs them and they try to do as they did with John the Baptist, with Jesus, with the apostles, with the angel messengers. In other words, they try to, because of that religious seal and all those evil spirits that get into them, 
they try to shut their mouth so that they don't continue speaking all those things which are being spoken and the devil is exposed where he is and many times they fulfilled their objectives they fulfilled it in let us talk about this three that he spoke of there they fulfilled it or two they fulfilled it in John the Baptist when they cut off his head they fulfilled it in Jesus when they crucified him and he says there in the messengers also look how they treated them and also Revelation 11 that is they are also going to kill them but all of that has a program already God already has a divine program for that but woe to those who become part of that because they will be the instruments of the evil one for those scriptures to be fulfilled and they will no longer have an opportunity so therefore all of this time in which we are living is a very but very decisive time for mainly for that group of the foolish it is very but very decisive because it will depend on whether they live eternally or not to live eternally let us continue reading in the message the coming of the cornerstone a small paragraph that remains there it says and look at the scripture what it says in revelation 11 so if god already saw everything that is going to happen it is better then to go ahead and say everything that needs to be said before we are too late before the time comes when nothing can be said and then look if i had known i would have spoken sooner because now there is no time well we want to speak in every service what needs to be spoken and thus go step by step with the plan of god and all these things you can see that they have been spoken and bringing all this as fast as possible because already that if he spoke it there is because there may come a time when they will try to silence the bride so that she will not continue preaching those things that she is preaching under that ministry that God has on the tent. He continues saying in the book of quotations, I left off about the last sentence of paragraph 1486, but when the church once gets it, the elect is called out and separated. Then in the presence of God, I know it will be something like people was there and he put paradise when he takes its rapture. I'm going to read a little bit before again so that you can link this, we will say, what we were half through. I think I better read it all complete so that it remains again because I made that interruption there in the middle to read from that message. It says, let's read it all. I believe the church is beginning to hear the message and beginning to understand. But friend, listen, we've got to lay in the presence of the Son. We've got to be ripened. Our faith is ripe. Intellectually, we are hearing the message that God has given us and seeing the signs that He showed us and proving it by the Bible. It's there, but oh, how the church needs to lay in his presence till it tenders up, you know, and get sweet in the spirit so that it can bathe down. Sometimes in speaking the message, you get harsh, have to break it in like that, because you've got to clench a nail to make it hold. And he wrote down nail. But when the church once gets it, the elect is called out and separated. 
See, there is a separation. Then in the presence of God, and he writes there, most holy place. I know it'll be something like the people was there, paradise, when it takes its rapture. And he writes, it will be like the people there in paradise and the rapture. And he makes a drawing of the cornerstone. He divides the seventh age there. And above on the cornerstone, he writes eight. And beside it, he writes, the sun to ripen our faith, the light. And also again, he writes, the sun. That is the light, the sun, to ripen our faith. That could be the topic that we will place here in this talk. The light to ripen our faith. May God bless you. May God keep you. And thank you for this opportunity that you allow me to send this greeting to all the brothers and sisters who will hear these words of greeting later on. God bless you and God keep you all.